All right, so let's let's read it again. So minister, what's his name? Copeland or something? Not Copeland. That's a different guy. And I don't. I want to be respectful. Obviously, it's a it's a person of authority. Minister Coping. All right. So the, it's the new minister that the other one was replaced. I just learned that uh, this was a minister of labor, and now he's minister of healthcare. And the minister of healthcare is now minister of labor. <laughs> so. Uh, all right. But here is what they admit. Uh, this is what they say. We need to make decisions based on good information. Okay. This is what I want to say. So part of his statement is the bottom line is that it remains your choice whether to be vaccinated for yourself and for your kids if you're a parent. Which I don't think is necessary to say. Or for your kids, if you're a parent, is unnecessary, I think, right? But whatever. Uh, <clears throat> So the government knows that. The government knows that uh, we have the right, and um, sometimes they come out as uh, as uh, as people that uh, it has to be this way. And of course, we. I just heard these uh, two experts, medical expert. It was some. Um, I think it was a former health officer from like a previous years, and then there was some big shot in uh, the University of Alberta or something like that. And they said, you know, we need to we need to do something serious. We need to, you know, in you know. Uh, force uh, vaccinations we need to do more uh, and we need to really do something to stop this avalanche of evil so um, yeah you know that there is people like that that they they have they would love to get rid of our rights and um, listen even if they accomplish it one day you still you have your rights they're, they're un what do they say unalienated i messed up the word uh, uh, yeah, so they cannot take your, your rights. Your rights are given by God and the government is smart and they recognize that such a thing exists. Just like it's just like engineer is smart to recognize that there is a gravity. Right? It's very wise to think about it. It's good to recognize that there is magnetism for certain principles. It's, it's smart, right? It's the same thing with principles like this. And if the government and it's nice to hear that among the turmoil, we still have some sanity coming out, although, like I said, I suspect this is really a bit of a legal protection. So that in the future, if somebody puts them, you know, sues them, uh, they will say, well, we, we didn't say that you have to. We were just strongly encouraging based on a science. We didn't know. We were told. And, uh, and of course, there's going to be lawsuits because people uh, will be hurt. You know, and they gave some statistics, you know, like here, for example, of the 16,000 individual reports, and that is medical injuries and stuff like it because of vaccines, right? So he debunks it. He says, of the 16,000 individual reports, which is 0.029% of all Canadians, doses administered, 4,288 were considered serious. So it's not as bad, right? Because it's only 0.008%. It's only... 4,000. You know, when 9-11 happened, 3,000 people died. And we had a huge panic. But this is only 4,000 just in Canada, right? Or, or is it in Alberta? No, this is Government of Canada. So for Canada. This is what they admit, right? 4,000 already serious issues. 16,000 total. And 12,000, they say it's not as bad. But 4,000, okay, we admit this one is really bad. But it's only 4,000. So I understand that everybody that goes to a clinic to get a shot is like, I wonder if I am that one of the 0.008%. Maybe it would be better to take the other shot, 0.001%, that if I do get a COVID, I will actually survive. I mean, considering the two options, right? Think for yourself. Don't let them push you. You have the right. And by the way, here's another thing that they say. They say that you have to think of other people. And it sounds so good, right? Because you don't want to think of yourself. That's so selfish. But this is communism. I've, I grew up in communism. I know what it's like. Like We all have to think of the common good. Hence the word communism. And uh, I don't know. I thought that the West, you know, endorse and uh, accept the idea of individual liberties, right? Liberty of an individual. So that's, you have it.
You have uh, your liberty and responsibility to, to protect your children, protect yourself, protect your body. And no person, no matter how high they think they are in the position of government, have the right to, uh, they can try. They, 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 they certainly, anybody can, has, a, has a right to be foolish, I suppose. Anybody can utter nonsense. We are for freedom of speech, right? We're okay. You know, you have a silly idea, share it with us. I already heard 10 of your silly ideas, so I'm probably not going to listen to 11th one, right? But you certainly have the right. Can I have the right to, to speak my mind and do what I want with my body? So this whole idea that we have to do to protect others is obviously deception. You have to do to protect yourself. That is your responsibility. That is your responsibility, to, to take care of yourself. And then whoever God puts you over as an authority, that's your wife for a man and children for, for mother and father. Those are people that you are responsible for and uh, you will be one day giving account for that. Well, I know, but uh, I was told. You are the parent, right? So uh, just get it out of my chest. <clears throat> Let's pray. We'll read First uh, Peter chapter 3 again today. And then we can talk about and enjoy the warmth of the evening. Lord, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for giving us your word and for giving us responsibilities for our lives, for our bodies, for our children, for our families, for our property. And that property ought not to be shared with somebody, but people steal things and steal children and steal families and destroy them. And they come under the cloak of being helping. But in fact, they are coming to rob and to destroy. Lord, help us to stay strong in whichever way your word <clears throat> is applicable. Whether it's uh, in a case of a family, in the case of our spiritual well-being, in the case of my own body. Help us to be people of some conviction, strength, but also meekness and mercy with people <clears throat> that perhaps uh, unrighteously and unjustly push us to corner and hurt us. Help us, Lord, to be people of, uh, of that meek and quiet spirit that you have and you show to us. And today as we study your word, Lord, help us to see where we need to go as, a, as individuals, also as a church. Lord, please bless us as we open your precious word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so 1 Peter chapter 2, 3. All right, we finished with uh, verse uh, 7. So we talk about submission a lot, remember? We talk about submission of servants to their masters. We talk about submission to government. We talk about submission of wife to their husbands. We talk about submission of children to their parents. There's a lot of different authority structures that we need to understand and respect. It's not... It's not that there is one authority and as the government and everybody else, you know, reports to the government. Yes, we all report to government in certain areas and in certain areas we don't. We, we don't report to in everything to some uh, uh, police guy, right? They have a certain laws that they enforce and certain things is none of their business. Uh, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, I'm a father and I'm a pastor. You, you respect me as, as, as a pastor, which I appreciate. Well, uh, but that doesn't mean that I have authority to tell you everything. Right? Can I go to Danny's family and say, from now on, Danny, you're going to have to get rid of this TV? I'd be okay with it. <laughs> you shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, you, you see what I mean? You know, like uh, there is a jurisdiction. And, uh, you know, and it's, uh, there's a jurisdiction even within this country. You know, like you have a federal jurisdiction and provincial and county and... And uh, individual, there's different jurisdictions that have to be understood. 
And this whole idea that we're gonna have one person that's just gonna rule everything, well, that's called dictatorship. But that's, uh, that, is that what we want? We don't want that, right? So, <clears throat> even if that uh, happens, we still have to be like Mordecai, and yeah, if they tell us everybody needs to bow down, well, you don't have to bow down. It's not their right to say that. I mean, they can try, but it's, it's, it's obviously illegal. <clears throat> so we're going to continue from verse 8. And the Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you your good conversation in Christ. For it is better... If the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing, then for evil-doing. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few that his eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereon to even baptism does also now save us, not the putting of away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So let's just finish with the end. What does it say in the end? The Bible says, Jesus is gone into heaven, but he's not gone. He's not absent. He's not involved. Not, nothing like that. He's very much involved. And remember before Jesus left, and he gave the great commission on, in Matthew chapter 28, we find it there. When he gave the great commission, what does it say? What is the beginning of the statement? of the Great Commission. You know, go therefore to the whole world and spread gospel at all. Right? But it does, that's not the first thing he says. The first thing he says is, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I was just today thinking, you know, there's, I think there is a bit of a contest. Some people really would like to be all powerful. Now we all have some power. God gave us power. You know, he, he builds a man. And he gives him muscle and deep voice and he makes him bigger than the woman and then the children. It's a natural way to endorse his role as an authority. So he is big and deep voice and he's stronger. So God gives us power. God gives you power to fight if you get in some little petty fight. Obviously, if somebody gets on you with a machine gun, you're probably not going to have enough power to overcome it. But that little power is going to help you. It's going to help you from fall. It's going to, and of course you have a power of your brain and power of your mouth. We can be very powerful. And of course then we have a power in Christ, right? That's a power too. So God gives us power, but God never gives to anybody all power. You know, and even, but it, isn't it funny that he says that all power is given unto me. All power. So how is it possible that God has all power and yet I have some power? Well, if I have some power, that means that God has less power, right? 
No, this doesn't work like that with God, right? God is extremely intelligent and it's possible for him to let you decide as you want and he still has a full power over what you do. And this is what we struggle with when we discuss the whole idea of um, the Calvinism, you know, the, the Arminianism and Calvinism, right? God or is it man? So that we, have, we, we have a hard time to understand it, that we can have a power and yet God has a sovereign power over it, right? <clears throat> so isn't that wonderful that actually it's only one that has all the power? And that's obviously God, benevolent, loving, and just, and true God. Oh, thank God that that's the way it is, right? Because there are definitely candidates and people that aspire to get this power, to have all power. And we know that they try to, they have power, they have money and influence, and they try to put themselves in a position where they have more and more power until they reach some top. Well, this devil, right? The devil is like that. And I know that, it, it, well, let's separate it. These are people, that's a devil. If you study Ezekiel chapter 28, when God speaks about the devil, he starts with the king of Tyre. He's talking to the king of Tyre. And then before you know it, you don't even know where the heck it changed. You know he's not talking about just man. He's talking about the devil. So sometimes, you know, I sometimes didn't understand why, why does a person call another person a devil? Well, certainly it's not an angel or something that's fallen. But sometimes it could be that a person just about perfectly represents the devil. And are there people that are driven by the lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, and love of money to put people into slavery? Do, do we have that? And guess where they are going? You know, you th first you thought they are going after money, so they have their yacht, they have their Lamborghini, they have their ocean resorts and uh, aeroplanes and everything like that, but it's just never satisfied, right? It's just never enough, because you have to go, go, go all the way to the top. Where is at the top? All power. But thank God that all power, which is the pinnacle of everything, is not some stupid eye of horrors, but it's Jesus. You know, you, you, you go up and you're thinking, all this evil is going on, and you're thinking, when I get all the way to the top, there's going to be the top evil. And you come to the top, and actually, at the top, Despite all the conspiracy, despite of the rebellion that's going underground, you'll find Jesus. And his power is going to trickle down. It's going to happen. So it's a great thing to know that we are, number one, on the good side. We are with the Lord, and he's benevolent, just, fair, loving. He's our friend. He saves us. He actually died for our sins, right? He speaks about it. He says that we have that sort of a friend in heaven. So this is the all power, the all authority in heaven. That's who is really at the top. And no, no person is going to replace him there. We know that the devil tries. It's not going to work out. How does it look like? Well, it looks like how we see it in this world. That's how it looks like. Yeah, that, that's what it is. They are really pushing for domination of mankind. This... The, the, we shouldn't be that surprised. We have it in the Bible. The Bible tells us that's what they're going to do. So when we what, we'll look at it, it's like we compare it to the Bible and say, all right, everything is according to the plan. That's how it's supposed to be. So that just tells me that we ought not to be concerned too much. We should not be too much concerned. And that's what this chapter very much is about, right? So he says, finally, be all of one mind. Before we go back to it, let's go back to verse 8. And he says, be all of one mind. So here we are, you know, smaller group, but not insignificant. God cares. God said, you know, all I need is two or three that gather in my name. It was far more than that. So it's a blessing to be together as uh, brothers and sisters. And listen, the Bible says that it is important that we are all of one mind. What does that mean? 
Well, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. We are not people like, a, like the world tries sometimes to create some kind of artificial unity where they use propaganda and everybody, you know, through TV, entertainment and media and everything like that. Everybody think the same way. It's never going to work. It's never going to work. You will never get, for example, 100% vaccine success. It will never happen. Just like you cannot kill all the mosquitoes and call, kill all the frogs. It will never, it's, it doesn't work. Now you can reduce the population, but you will never get 100% success. So that's a false unity. That's not how unity gets uh, accomplished. To be of, of a one mind, you have to have a free people that by their decision and desire have a common, have a, they, they, something glues them together. And what is the thing that glues them together? Well, the Lord, the one that has all the power and the one that we love because he saved us. And of course, the word of God, which is identical to Christ, right? It's the same thing. That's what brought us today. Hence, it is, that's what brings us together. Hence, it is so important that we are clear and very, very defensive about the one more, most important thing. What is it? That book. That book. I know that people say, oh, come on, you're a little bit too picky on that. How can I not be? I mean, you take away that, everything starts to crumble. To really have a one mind and to have a unity, Christian unity, it's impossible if we leave the foundation, if we leave Christ. Now, what does it mean to, to be of one mind? For example, have compassion one of another. Also, to be pitiful, love one another and be courteous. So it's something we have to work on. I have to work on it. I'm not done. <laughs> Far from being awesome. Far from being awesome. Um, I am, like I said, uh, was it uh, last Thursday or Sunday? I am a miserable man like you are. We all uh, are, are broken people. Uh, but we submit ourselves to the leadership of God, to Jesus, and we want Him to be really that foundation in our life. And as a result, you know, we want to be like him. What did he do? Well, he, he loved. And uh, I know it's, uh, you know, we hurt each other sometimes, right? You know, we say silly things or we, we get misunderstood. We say something that's being misunderstood. You know, we, we say things. That's probably the most hurtful. Or maybe do something that's, that's kind of was a little awkward. And, uh, and then people put you in a certain category. You know, we should not be people that put one another to a category, right? I could be easily put in a certain category, all right? Uh, Anna could be put in a category. You know, Danny could be put in a category. You could be put in a category. Yeah, we, this is what people do naturally. We just put somebody in a box and there's just a lost case. Well, that's not, that's not mercy, all right? We, we obviously have to learn to be patient. Got to be a little bit different people than the people around us. And uh, there's a lot of good people out there, but they're only good because they didn't hurt each other yet. What do we do when we offend one another? Now, not in an offense in a, in a biblical sense, I suppose, but maybe what if, we, what if we hurt one another, right? What do we do? Now, this is where, where it becomes important. We ought to be different. And, uh, you know, we can talk about forgiveness some other time. But the Bible clearly tells us that we ought to be merciful, pitiful. Pitiful means you have a compassion over somebody that's struggling and suffering. That's why we share, you know, what's going on in your life and in your daughter's life and in your life, you know. And we, we want to know to pray one for another, but we want to not just be obsessed about ourselves, right? I don't want to just come here and see what I can get out of it. Now we need to learn to a little bit understand what everybody is going through. You know that Louis has arthritis, and then some, I don't know, is it arthritis? 
You know, you know, she has that. You know, she has this. You know, you have this issue. You have, you have a problem at work. You have a that issue. The problem with um, vaccine mandates and all this. We want to talk about it. We don't want to be just gossipy gossipers. In fact, we don't want to be gossipers. <laughs> you know, we don't want to be gossipers at all. But we want to understand what we all go through so that we can have compassion and and understand that that's what hold us together, right? That's different than the world. For he that will love life, oh, here, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. Okay, so this just continuation, what does it mean to love one another and uh, how to be pitiful and forgiving and so on? It means that we're not going to just pay somebody back. And don't we all have that tendency? I have the tendency to pay back. You know, when we get hurt, when we get put, uh, when we are make like we are now, right? People that are not taking vaccine are evil people, according to some people. You know, that makes me angry. Right? That, that drives me nuts. I am now the evil one. <laughs> you know, and of course, divide society. It makes us uh, now separate into two different groups. The good people that take vaccine, and then the old the evil people that are responsible for the evil. This is obviously a very dangerous card that our government is playing. It's completely use. It's, it's really foolish. Because this has been done before, it never ended up good. Ends up with blood. And people, are, you know, people are too completely irresponsible to do this. But, okay, so that's the world, right? Madness of the mass. All right. But are we like that? We do, we're not different from anybody else out there. We certainly have that tendency too. And, uh, so, you know, sometimes, sometimes we get offended because of uh, something that was just misunderstood. But sometimes you really do say something that may be really hurtful. Or your action may be very health, hurtful. Or maybe lack of action can be very hurtful. So obviously we ought to grow, but we have to learn to not pay back with evil for evil. Further, it says that um, he that love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. I have to watch my tongue and I have said certain things, uh, even to you all, you know, that I thought ah, I shouldn't have said that. Um, so we, we th think about it, the, the greatest evil that we deal with in our life is not some government or some uh, ultra-rich people. The greatest evil is right in your mouth, right? And who can tame it? Who can tame the tongue? James speaks about it, right? Who can tame the tongue? Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him speak peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This is a great verse. This is a great promise. That again tells me, there's a Lord. Don't you see the evil? Well, this is actually pretty pretty, you know. There is not a really good example here, but out there, right? The Lord, don't you see it out there? Don't you see the criminals? Don't you see the people hungry after money? and power, and they will not stop at anything, but they will try to get it and even kill. Lord, don't you see it? And the Lord says, I do see it. And I, he says, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Now, what does it mean to be righteous? There is none righteous, none, not one, right? Okay, so how does that apply? So we know the righteous person is a person that is saved, is born. So, so if you are building to Christ, you're righteous. You're righteous. And, uh, and the Bible says that Jesus is over the righteous. Jesus, his eyes is, uh, is over the righteous. That's a promise. That's a good uh, thing to be reminded of. The, even though it may look like the Lord is not there, He is there right here. We just read it. And if He's here, then it's real. So He is over the righteous. I would be worried if I was not righteous. 
Now, it's not my righteousness, like I just said. But I, I think uh, a person that does not have a Christ and they go through this junk that we have to go through these days, that must be difficult if they understand what's going on. Most people don't understand, right? Just go with the flow. But there are a lot of people that are not saved and they understand that this is not good news. This is not going well. That's the, that, I, I, don't, I don't know. That, that seems to be the worst situation. But uh, we know that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His ears are open unto their prayers. So that means that the Lord is listening and He cares what's going on when we turn to Him in our prayers. Hence, let's pray about things. He said that He understands and He will listen to what we uh, have to ask for. But notice, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, can He name people out there that we already identified that they are fueling this evil what's going on in our society and of course there's other schemes that are going on not just you know stupid vaccine there's other stuff that's going on but they're evil and the bible said that god's face is against these people against them that do evil <clears throat> to me that's enough because I have somebody that cares for me. I have someone that's all-powerful, right? We just talked about how he is all-powerful. And this all-powerful is against them that do evil. That ought to let us rest a little bit. What else he said? He cares for the righteous. Great. And also he's listening to our prayers. I mean, what else do you want? Right? It covers everything. That means that we have somebody that cares. Somebody that likes us, he's for us, and he's ready to listen. But of course, he's not that kind of a person that just listens. Okay, let me just go about my business. When, he, when God listens, that means he's going to do something about it. And at the same time, he hates evil, or them that do evil. So this has to be our resting place. This has to be our resting place. Now, let's deal with... Uh, unfair treatment of them that do good who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good so it's a good start right this part it's a good start who is he that will harm you if you do good because normally actually even in a corrupted system it's typically evil people that in the end get their portion even unjust system punishes evildoers. It does work like that. So why should we take uh, pain for that? We shouldn't have to. Hence, it is important that we live holy life, that we live life worthy of our calling, right? It's not good to be suffering for being fools. And yes, you can have a Christian and he can be punished. He can be suffering because of his unrighteous deeds all right that can be that, that's definitely possible but the bible says it's going to probably happen less than more but then he says but and if you do suffer for righteousness sake right well lord 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 you, you you're saying um who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good well i know one i know two I know three, then he continues to say, well, but if you do suffer for righteousness sake, then guess what? Happy are you. That's good. Happy are you. Now, how can I be happy? That doesn't make me happy. Well, yes, it makes you happy. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the one example I can think of is when Peter and John were preaching uh, in the temple and they were grabbed and brought uh, to the authorities there and beaten. And they were commanded not to speak in that name anymore. And they say, you know, consider for yourself. Should we obey you or God? And then they beat them and they let them go. And what did they do? They were happy because they were considering themselves to be worthy of suffering for Christ. So this is where we need to be different from uh, the world. The world is concerned and they are fighting because the Lord is not with them. They don't have somebody to speak to. 
They don't have their buddy all the way at the top called Almighty. They don't have that. In fact, they are also being a target of an anger of God. So let's be careful because there are a lot of fire, uh, freedom fighters out there. There are lost people and I am not part of that crowd. We are not with them. We are not with them. First of all, we have that peace, we have that assurance that the Lord is with us. And second, if they do harm us, we actually are happy. Now, can they say that? They cannot say that. But we, so it's a, it's a funny how it works because when you suffer for righteousness sake, the Lord promised that we will have a great reward in heaven. Must be reminded of that. No matter what they do to us, as long as we stay on the path of faith, Everything works together for good to them that trust Him. No matter what they do. So if you find yourself, let me just be practical now, if you find yourself in a closet, in a bed, what are we going to do? I don't know. I mean, this is not looking good. You're not in the right position, right? It's not a good place. You have to, and maybe in these days we have to do it more frequently, to wash it off and go back to scriptures like this. And be reminded, I do not belong in that place. I do not belong in a category where I am concerned because they come with these mandates and because they may force me into this or that. That's not us. That ought not to be us. Now, if you understand that's what he's talking about, that it is not right for a Christian to be overly concerned about these things, because remember, the Almighty is at the top, He cares for us, He listens to our praise, and He hates the evildoers, right? And on top of that, if they harm us, happy are you. It's good for you. This, this, will, this will count for a benefit in the future. This will turn to good. This will turn to gold. Or more than that. And then He says, if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And... Be not afraid of their terror. And terror, you know, to talk about terrorism. That's a terrorism. You know, people that go around and freely nowadays in media say, oh, these people should be, these people should be restricted going from here to there and not, not being able to buy things and not having a job. Not, and I'm thinking, yeah, why don't you just kill us, right? Why don't you just get rid of us completely? Wouldn't that be wonderful, you idiot? The Bible says, and this is a terrorism. You know, they, they have these hate law speeches, right? They have hate law, hate law, left and right, hate law, hate law, hate speech. Who's suing them? Idiots, hateful people. What have we done to them, right? But as we should not be surprised. We should not be surprised. This just, you know, Peter spoke about it 2,000 years ago. How many times that happened in the history? Many times. So the answer to that, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terrorism. Because they are terrorists. Be not afraid. And if you are, ter if you are afraid, and naturally, obviously, we are concerned, then uh, seek that peace again. You have to frequently come to the Word of God and be reminded that you are actually happy. Because when you think about it, aren't they actually quite miserable? Think about it. They are, they are target of God's uh, judgment. They are miserable. All they have is money maybe and some career opportunities. Well, we have so much in there. Huh? So be not afraid. When you are afraid, you kind of give to their a narrative, right? You kind of uh, help them to feel better. Because they want, uh, you know, it gives them pleasure, I suppose, uh, to kind of beat you. But if you keep standing and you're peaceful, ah, right, it, 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 it irritates them. And not that we should do it for that purpose, but, you know, like, don't give it to it. And the idea of standing for what God gave you, uh, the idea is that you are not going to be afraid of their evil, of their scare. Is that a dog? <clears throat> He says, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart 
and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, I think that it's here because I suspect that if you really stand the right way, if you do stay in the peace, and if you don't give to that terror, despite of all the evil that may be happening, if you really stand and are peaceful and actually are humble about it and not, uh, you know, returning evil with evil, if you are like that, I think people will notice that and they will want to know what is the reason of the hope that is in you. And I think there will be a great opportunity for you to tell one day. And I think, uh, I think we are probably heading off you know, it's interesting that uh, the Bible says two things about the end times. It says that the uh, love of many shall wax cold. And we, we know that there's going to be terrible deception and terrible uh, backsliding, right? But also at the same time, the Bible says that the gospel will be preached all over the world. It almost sounds like two, two contradictions. It's like a contradiction, right? But actually, maybe it will be because of the evil. And because of the testimony of the true righteous people, that actually gospel will, in the end, that will be the hockey stick, right? It's not going to be visible because, in a sense, that there's going to be churches popping out all over the place. Churches may be, you know, illegal. Uh, who knows what? But the church will never be stopped, like I said before. It will, and I suspect they will grow exponentially. So we are, may, if we are in the end times, I, I am skeptical, but if we are, uh, then uh, listen, uh, we are in a very exciting era and that we will be able to actually, this will be talked about in heaven and people will be jealous, you know? It's like, man, I wish I was in your shoes, you know? And we go back, hey, what are you talking about? You had a, you know, great plague of this and that and, and you are in Babylon, what are you talking about? No, but you guys said it's so cool, you know? It's, um, it's a blessing to be in this time. And let's not be concerned that uh, we are losing our country. Let's be concerned if we are afraid. If we are weak. Let's, yeah, that, that, that's what you need to be concerned about. Or if you are judged for something stupid that you've done, right? If you are meek and if you are taking the position of not returning evil with evil, but are faithful, then God will bless it. And uh, it's going to be one of the greatest periods of history. And we potentially could be living in it. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, is that happening already? They may speak evil of you, as of evildoers, like, you know, responsible for the evil, it's uh, happened so many times. It happens in communist Russia. It happened in Chinese Russia. All the farmers, often Christians, they were target of the city people that hated them. And it's strange how, it, how our country is divided. I mean, who votes all the communists to our government? It's the people, people in the cities. If you look at the map of just about even Ontario, right? If you go outside of the Toronto area, Toronto is completely liberal. Once you go to, to outside of Toronto, people are a lot more value driven. Same thing in Alberta, you know, in, you will, you'll get some uh, left in, leftist uh, elected in Calgary and Edmonton. Not to say that the blue is completely really blue, right? You know, it's uh, often just liberal by a different name, you know? So they may speak about us as evildoers, that you may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So there's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to be a time where the people that made fun of us or called us evil, they will not be laughing anymore. And it's going to be, uh, hopefully it's going to come about better. You know, when like Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul went around and called people evil because they were following this Jesus. And so he called them evil. But one day actually God stopped him and then he was ashamed. Right? He was ashamed. He said, you know what? I'm sorry. I should, I, I. And he was ashamed for the rest of his life. He said, I shouldn't be even called apostle because I have uh, wasted the church. He got some people killed. Possibly.
we know for sure, Stephen, but uh, potentially more. And uh, so he was brought to shame, and thank God it was in the context of him humbling himself um, uh, under, uh, to, you know, before God. But, but if people don't do it by themselves before it's time, then they will be brought to their knees by the, you know, terror of God one day. And then they're going to be ashamed. Like that rich man in, uh, in hell, right? You know, okay, what, what was I thinking? At least, you know, help my brothers. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also has once suffered. And that's the example, that's where we will end. That God suffered. God sent Jesus to suffer. Don't buy into the idea that we will not suffer. We will suffer. We are appointed to suffering. Which sometimes we're disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. I think in the days of Noah people suffered. Righteous Noah, I think, suffered. I think he was a target of uh, mockery and, uh, and, uh, and being called evil, or who knows what. I think that so in Sodom, Lot was suffering. The Bible tells us that his soul was waxed with the unrighteousness of the Sodomites. And so we are being waxed, we suffer, as we are waiting for the redemption. And this is what we are appointed to. This is quite normal. You know, sometimes people say, my goodness, you know, like that pastor from Ontario. What's happening to us? <laughs> it's normal. Yeah, we'll come to the world. This is, it. this is what it is. This is, by the way, what most people experience all around the world. There was a bit of a, you know, puff of freedom a little bit. Uh, in, in, there's certain freedoms for certain periods in certain places. And it kind of travels. But you know, there's no place where it's just permanently good. You know, it was England in 1500s was killing pastors, burning them at a stake. It was England. And it may be England again or Canada. So these things are temporary. What's happening to us? We're living in a corrupted world that belongs to God, but it's stolen by the devil. So we are, nothing is happening to us, nothing extraordinary. We are. And uh, everything is, yeah, how, is, how it is. You know, the Bible tells us about it. Uh, God has a judgment date coming and he's a redemption plan for those that can get out of it. And so um, I think we covered all of it in this chapter. Uh, in conclusion, in summary, what is the main thing? Jesus is the Almighty. Got to be reminded of that. No Bill Gates, no Carl Schwab or whatever, all these uh, ultra-rich people, they, they are not almighty. Or the government, they're not almighty. Doesn't belong uh, to them. That's sort of a power. They don't have that power. They certainly want it. We are people that are appointed to be a light to this world. And the best time and the best testimony that's ahead of us it will be in a time when there will be a lot of evil and persecution. And uh, we will most likely be fine. Most of the Christians will be just fine. You will kind of just make it through. Right? You know, it may look like a waterfall and very violent and, you know, but hey, you know, you're like a little molecule of the water. It makes it, eventually makes it down. Eventually, it makes it completely down and continues on its way. You know, so most likely, we'll be just fine. Isn't that true that a lot of people are concerned about things that never come to pass? So, I know that uh, all these stories, especially lost people, right? They bring out all those fears. And we sometimes, oh my goodness, you're right, right? We got to be different. We got to be different. We are not idiots. We understand that these things are happening. But we're not going to be saying, what's happening to us? We know what's happening. We are redeemed. We're not afraid of their terror. And if they harm us for something that we do good, like standing for our liberties or standing for our rights, or standing for our children, or protecting our bodies, or whatever it is, or for the gospel, it doesn't come to that yet, right? But, you know, it will probably continue all the way there. Then we will stand for that. 
They will want us to bow down and we were not going to bow down. Because um, it's not right for a Christian to bow down to someone that wants to have all power. So will we be frustrating to them? That's why they call us evildoers. Because oh, it's like this, like Haman, right? Mordecai would just not bow down and he just ate him. Every time he saw it, he's like, oh, I, I will never have a piece until this guy is hanging on a tree. He just can't, can't get rid of it. So let's not be surprised if they're frustrated and if they channel and if they, if they spew hatred out there in the ether. Let's not be surprised. It's fine. Happy are you. Be not afraid of their terror. Let's finish with prayer. Lord, how often we can be um, moved and shaken because of uh, the evil and the concern that we see out there, but also because of people out there that don't have a hope in you or maybe are not grounded Christians. And they somehow spread this panic to a point that we start to be concerned as well. Help us, Lord, to not be blind to what's happening around us and call spades paid and everything like that, but help us at the same time, regardless of how bad things may be, to be grounded in your word, be solid, and be fully expecting you to listen to our prayers and to relieve us. Or, or take us through the fire somehow. And Lord, above all things, let truly this be an opportunity for us to shine to people so they can be saved. We noticed that when things were heated up because of pastors being arrested and closed down churches and all that stuff, that few people here and there, they started to realize and they started to actually be interested in your word. So Lord, it's not bad. Maybe we need more of this. Maybe we need to shake it off, our allegiance to some great country. Lord, if you give it to us, fine. But if you don't, let us be, help us to be faithful and be uh, truly people really of a different nation, different kingdom. And uh, understanding that we're just passing through, we're just foreigners. We don't belong here. And Lord, uh, let us not be surprised when the world hates us because we will not bow down. Help us have a peace and patience and humility and meekness so that it can be truly a blessing to people that are shaken and they don't have the Almighty at the top. In Jesus' name, amen.